Yeah! Metal Mouth Media here with Murray from Dayglow Abortion. Now, I, I want to go way back when you first started, 1980. What was the scene like in BC? Were you guys like pretty original when it came to your sound? Was there a lot of band with your sound at the time? Well, no, actually nobody was here. <laughs> when we started off, it was funny because um, I guess, I mean, uh, I was a bit of a metalhead in the 70s when I grew up. I was like into Black Sabbath and I got into all kinds of weird shit, fusion and everything like this. And then uh, the music scene sort of fell apart for me when Ozzy left Black Sabbath, actually. It was, uh, and uh, you know, and I looked around, I'd been, I heard about these uh, guys, the Sex Pistols. They kept talking about them on, uh, on CBC radio and shit like that, but they wouldn't play their music, eh? They'd just go on about how they'd spit on old ladies and stuff like this, and I was thinking, spitting on old ladies, that sounds like fun, you know? I mean, and uh, <laughs> so uh, I just, I started playing uh, what I assumed was punk rock, <laughs> but, uh, and I didn't actually hear any real other punk rock until maybe a year after I started doing it, so I had a pretty good start on what I thought was punk rock. I figured, okay, well, it's going to have to be angry and fast and all of this sort of stuff. Turns out I was a little off the mark, eh? What I was, uh, I was playing pretty well metal shit, you know, for the most part. But uh, we, 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 it was funny too because the Victoria punk scene was predominantly all these rich kids from the other side of town, eh? They had instruments and music lessons and shit. Me and my friends were from the other side of the tracks, like literally from the other, uh, you know, and uh, they, were, they were kind of terrified of us. Just, I mean, our bass player had just gotten out of jail, stuff, <laughs> you know, stuff like this. Uh, it was, uh, we were sort of a bit different breed than the, than the other guys, but we made friends with them all. I mean, uh, these are guys like No Means No and the Neos and uh, like a bunch of bands that did a lot of really good shit, eh? And uh, we, it, we had a pretty tight uh, scene there going and uh, got right around early 80s. It was just rocking in Victoria. There was tons of good bands and, uh, you know, and all kinds of stuff. We, uh, we were always the odd guys out kind of thing. Uh, in fact, uh, from what I remember, we were kind of, they didn't really like us much in our hometown until they started liking us other places first, you know, and uh, they were like, we, we hit it off big in Vancouver when we went over there, right? And uh, uh, I don't know, we just, like our first uh, album came out on Toxic Shock from uh, down in the States. We, we, we did the Out of the Womb ourselves. And then, uh, and sold just, like started actually in Victoria, that started some real controversy, I don't know, not really the right word, rye, border on riot scenarios, eh? The, uh, a local feminist group started smashing windows of record stores if they put our records in them and stuff. And uh, they actually, uh, a bunch of them came to my school. I was going to a community college and a bunch of them came to school and fucking attacked me at, at school. Oh yeah, they're, they're these, uh, these like, what would we call more? How do you the polite term for it? Morbidly obese hippie women uh, with their effeminate, you know, emancipated hippie husbands <laughs> and stuff. And they sick them on me. The husbands, they, go get them. There, he, there he is. Go get him. And these guys came at me. I remember taking my knapsack full of books and just clearing a swath through them there. Eh, with, with that, it was funny. They had a, we 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 got in a lot of trouble back. We weren't popular back in the day. I mean, it was. The whole punk rock thing was not popular to start with when I, and it was like, we just went right from, uh, right to the bottom rung of the social ladder well, there. In the you know? 80s, you always had to watch, because like the PMRC and all that, you had to like, everything yeah, was censored that. and you had to watch what you're going to say well, and that, do. That, and came out, that, that came out a bit after we yeah. started, like, and, and it's, because like our first album, we got the money of it, off it from this guy, this guy we knew who had inherited a bunch of money and he was had a job and he had a, was looking at losing a fair bit of it to taxes so he said why don't you guys make a record make a record that couldn't possibly be put in a record store couldn't just make of them not have gone you've got the right guy here i mean i'm the man for the job on this one so it was that we actually conspired to make an obscene record kind of thing like that eh? and uh, and then when uh which is sort of funny because that's what we were accused of several years later, right? and it really was. We sat down and we thought, "Hey, let's make a obscene record," <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, it had it had purpose in it, but it developed its purpose 
after the fact kind of thing a lot of the, in a lot of ways. Eh? Some of it was just like I was just writing songs. Oh yeah, you want a fucking gross song? I'll write you a gross song. You know, I mean, you know, does it have a purpose? No, it's yeah, it's gross. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what were their live shows back then? I know now. People mosh and they go batshit crazy when well, the band goes on. In 1980, first, when you guys came on, was it the same kind of okay, uh, reaction first, for the crowd? Before the day glows, I had this band called the Sick Fucks, eh? and uh, we had a we had a chick singer and stuff like that. And this um, this guy, this guy from a, like all the music in town was generally top 40 cover bands and stuff. Yeah. And they had the the bar circuit where you know, and some of my friends were playing in these bands and shit like this. And uh, they had their whole circuit and everything. And this. Guy from one nice wolf on there. This guy from uh, uh, one band there, he had the hots for our singer, and he, they were one of the more popular bands in town. And they were putting on a show at this at this place, the OAP Hall there. And they said, "Hey, let's hire these guys because he was had the hots for our singer. Hired um, our band to be the backup band for them at this fucking show." So. Um, we figured, okay, they're not going to like us, these people, and like, they're going to really not like us. And it's like a whole, like, 300 jocks in this place. It's going to be pretty dicey, eh? Our bass player was super tough, though. He wasn't afraid of nothing. He just got out of fucking jail and kicked their fucking heads in, eh, you know? <laughs> and uh, anyways, we, we go there. We got this guy. It was right around the time that Van Halen uh, eruption was on the top of the hit it just you know that had just come out it was the it really was a big craze at the time we knew this guy who looked just like Eddie Van Halen he's about yay tall really short just like Eddie Van Halen and he could play eruption so we got him to come and play eruption at the beginning of our set and it starts off and the fucking people in the audience hey eh, they were watching the man they're going my god you know i think that really is eddie van halen for christ's sake hey eh? and they're going oh my god and they're they're losing their shit over this hey eh? and about halfway through it our bass player's brother comes out this big guy comes out pulls out a 357 magnum hey eh? and it's uh and he's got a 357 magnum blank in it hey eh? pulls it out shoots eddie van halen who's got a blood capsule in his mouth and it goes, goes down and grabs him by the hair and drags him off the stage then we started playing punk rock for about maybe 30 seconds at the outside eh? and i remember we were playing and this fucking i saw this one guy try and punch this other dude beside him and the guy ducks like this and the guy slugged this lady right in the face eh? she just bam she goes spurt she goes down eh? and, uh, and the whole place started fighting eh? and the hook comes out oh we're off they're, they're freaking out. Our singer was crying and just, oh my God, they almost killed it. Like, we got our gear outside. Me and the bass player are laughing our fucking bags off. We're going, fuck, did you see that guy punch the lady in the face? Whoa! Like, <laughs> and like, and uh, they remember the, the guy fucking, he put the show on. We hooked the back doors, we were leaving, he's going, you'll never play in this town again. The guy's going, <laughs> and I was just like, fuck yeah. And also, you lived through an era where everyone bought physical copies and then streaming happened. Yeah. People stopped buying physical copy, which sucks when you're a professional musician. Well, yeah. But now everyone's getting back into vinyl and cassette yeah, yeah, yeah. and people are buying again. Is that motivation to write more albums now? Well, you Did know. You do that for a living. I mean, actually, I mean, to be honest, I don't write the albums for the money, you know? I mean, I write albums when I get. I get inspired to do so by something weird that's happening in the world usually eh? and like the last one was definitely the uh, election there going on between uh, <laughs> between bozo and buffoon between the cannibal child eating monster and yeah. fucking the narcissistic psycho real estate agent you know i mean they're going that's the best you fucking idiots can come up with for fuck's sake the leaders of the free world, come on, you know, I mean. <laughs> well, you say you write album when you're motivated. I remember when you wrote uh, Holy Shite, and then there was like 12 years before uh, yeah, yeah. Armageddon. Like, well, I quit, I quit the band for, for five or six years there. I had three other bands going and shit like that. And, uh, and yeah, I, I just, I was over it. I figured, ah, we've done enough here, you know. Me and Mike both quit on the same day. And it was Flipper that made us quit, actually. Uh, but I was so happy when I saw another album come out 12 years later. I was like, they're not done. No, no. They, uh, they t there was uh, the, the next one that I was on was, because uh, you see, I wrote a couple of songs that were on, uh, whatever it's called, Little Man in the Canoe or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, then I had this band, Lummox, uh, sort of country punk kind of thing like that. And... Uh, Lummox was the, the other guy in Lummox, uh, Merrick. The, he was just 
he, he's just a dangerous person to hang around with. I mean, he was fucking a sociopathic monster, you know. And uh, anyways, I uh, I fucking um, so I had some songs. We we went our we separate. We only did one album, eh? But we were pretty damn good though. But uh, we uh, I had bunch. I had some songs left over for it, and it was 2000, I guess. Yeah. And they talked me back into the band, so I said, oh, okay, let's make an album then. So we made Death Race. That was the uh, the oh, sort yeah, of, yeah, yeah. yeah, Death Race 2000. It was the, yeah, okay. that was kind of like the substance. The, up, right? I try and have a theme for each album, eh, a sort of, yeah. and try and have some kind of relation between the songs of one way. Like, Guano was kind of a spoof on metal. Fetus of Fetus is kind of a fucking parody of punk rock in a way, you know? And uh, uh, then, Two Dogs Fucking was just, that was a lot to do with the court case and all of that stuff and, and just making fun of all of those things. And uh, Death Race was the substance abuse album. After five years with Merrick Atkinson, uh, yeah, that was the substance abuse album was, uh, like we were actually in the studio. Jimbo was in the band then too. He was singing and uh, his uh, buddy's dad was worked for one of the airlines and he brought us this huge big duffel bag full of, uh, uh, airplane bottles of booze, eh? Just like oh, hundreds and hundreds of bottles of booze, eh? And uh, just the little ones there. So we were we were doing our vocal tracks. We were off. We went tore through those things. And I go to Jim Bugger. We still got some stuff to do here, eh? And uh, I noticed we're uh, out of booze. I said, "There's a bottle of Aqua Velva in the in the fucking bathroom medicine cabinet." And he goes. We need some shot glasses, eh? And he goes, I goes, you should maybe get that in the freezer, eh? And uh, he goes, Jimbo goes, I've already put it in the freezer. And I'm like, okay, okay. You're thinking on the same lines as me then. So we actually finished that doing shots of Aqua Velva. If I could do a shot and sing your vocal track. My breath was fresh for months after that. It was a... Uh, <laughs> And I also heard the horrible news about your diagnosis with cancer, with uh, colon cancer. Uh, as horrible as it is, it was um, relieving to see how everyone came together and trying to help. Like, there's hope in humanity. Like, oh my God, I gotta take back all of the cynical fucking shit I said about people for fuck's sake. It turns out they're not as bad as I thought they were. Eh? I mean, uh, and I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't have ever done. I wouldn't have done that myself. I would have sort of kept it quiet, except for. I felt like I had, we had this tour was booked before the, before I got the diagnosis yeah. even, eh? and uh, so I figured I'd better at least tell people they're going to be involved in the show, and it started with social media and shit, it started to get out pretty damn fast, so then I had to get a, make sure that everybody that, that needed to be told by me personally didn't hear about it on Facebook or some shit like that, eh? so I had to run around and get all that done, and then this guy approached me about the GoFundMe thing there, and I said, oh, and I was like, oh, you know, that's kind of, it feels like I'm sort of like mooching for money or something like that. I mean, but I'm glad he did. I mean, he talked some sense in me. I ain't got no fucking money. I mean, but uh, thanks to that, thanks to that. Everybody I've needs been, a hand when something like that happens. Yeah. And it's nice to see everyone come together. And even the, the nice skateboard they made of you. That's, oh, that was gorgeous. Yeah, no. That, that uh, yeah, the lady that did that, she, she took the picture at one of the shows there. And... Uh, that's that's on the back of it. It's kind of funny. Oh yeah, it's great if you want a picture of my face all over your shit. I guess. I mean, but uh, I think it's great. Yeah, it looks yeah, amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you skateboard as well? I haven't for quite a while. I mean, I, I did when I was a kid a bit, but I, I've broken my back. I've broken so many broken bones and shit. I'm not really cut out for that anymore. Uh, uh, Mark's Mark is blind. Mark is the best skateboarder in the t yeah. in the. In the band now and he's a pretty good fucking skateboarder for a blind guy actually not for a blind guy for anybody he, i saw him drop in on a got a 20 foot vert ramp in seattle for fuck's sake i wouldn't have done that ever in a million years you know I was, yeah 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 i did a bit i skated to the beer and wine store and shit like that you know how they did the old school skateboard and the new yeah, one they got, as well. they got both the old school ones kind of more get some big neoprene wheels on it and yeah. I can't handle those oh, parts. Those are great. You didn't bring any on tour by any chance. Uh, she was just, she was just selling those herself, yeah, and yeah. and I mean she sold that and raised a thousand bucks or something like that, and oh, yeah, sticking yeah. it in my bank account. I might even grab one. I don't even skate yeah. anymore because I got bad knees, but I might grab one myself just because I find it looks awesome. Yeah, no, and it was uh, there's been a bunch of that. Like I've pretty fairly been brought to tears a fucking bunch of times by the stuff that's been going on. Like the show in Toronto the other night was the most amazing thing I've ever fucking experienced in my entire life. I mean, I've never, never seen an audience that was so single-minded about something 
and it was all focused at us. Eh? You know, it's just like me and Matt were standing on stage going, "This is fucking out of control here." Eh? And I'm going, "Yeah." I mean, they were singing every word to every song, drowning out the PA. It was just crazy. I mean, it was. <laughs> well, you've been around for a long time. You you gathered a lot of fa uh, fans along the way. <laughs> it seems like it. You know, I mean. Uh, it just, you know, you, you, you try not, I try not to let that sort of stuff affect me, you know, or anything like that. But, oh, so me. what are your plans for the rest of the year? I know you're getting surgery next month. Are you yeah. going to focus on just relaxing, maybe writing a bit, or do you have anything else planned? I've got, uh, I, I'm really, I've, I've, I've got an album I want to do with these guys in Edmonton that's, uh, I've had for a while, I've been working on with these guys. Uh, they're, uh, they're day glow or? No, it's, no. it's just, it's some, some weird sh solo shit that I've done. Nice. And uh, they're they're kind of they got a, we got a pedal steel guy. It's like kind of country, kind of weird shit. It's uh, I got into uh, it's uh, anyways. That's that's a project I want to do. Uh, I'm I'm not too sure what it's going to be like. I've got no I can't really gauge this surgery yeah. thing. Like I'm good at recovering from shit. I've got lots of practice at that. And I like the, your positive attitude towards. I saw online how you. You're talking about you're gonna beat it and stuff, and I that's, think that's, that's half the battle. Important, you know, yeah, and that's that's, that's really why I'm on tour, you know, because yeah. uh, I could have. Uh, everybody was actually a lot of people were trying to talk me out of doing the tour, eh? and I'm going, no, fucking. I just think if I sat at home alone all summer with the tour canceled, sick, waiting to fucking, you know, for the inevitable, like just, I'm not gonna be a victim in this thing, yeah. eh? and I'm, I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna fight it, yeah, and that's uh, the right attitude. That's great. And uh, the uh, going out I'm with my best friends, and every night everybody's telling me how fucking great I am. And I mean, it's like that is keeping me positive. It's yeah, uh, yeah. I couldn't. I mean, I don't know, you know. And and, and when I when I left, you see, I got the radiation uh, program a week before I left, and about five days later, it kicked in, and it, oh my god, I was not feeling good. Eh? And uh, I guess it fucking took out my digestive system really for about a week, eh? And I was eating still though too, eh? And uh, I was hungry, but I wasn't shitting. I couldn't shit. I didn't shit for like ten days, and uh, four or five of those days I was on the road. We were fucking touring, eh? And it was getting real. I actually went to a hospital in Alberta, or into a clinic in Alberta, just to get some advice as to what the fuck I should do, because I was thinking. This is I'm going to get sepsis or something like that if this keeps up here, eh? And uh, uh, it it's sort of in steps. You see, I've been I've been I did a lot of reading when I got diagnosed. I looked at all of the potential alternative cures and picked out a whole bunch of them, like six or seven of them actually, that were accessible that I could do. I could get this. They didn't require fancy equipment. They didn't require anything that I couldn't just go and get. And thanks to the GoFundMe thing, I can go out and get the best supplements. Eh? Like I, think I could have had about ten or twelve grand or something like that out of it. Eh? And uh, and so I've got a you know knapsack full of the best shit, and it's pretty damn expensive when it gets. I was kind of shocked at how expensive some of the stuff is. Some of them like the mushroom stuff. Eh? Uh, a small price to pay if it works. Oh yeah, well yeah, that's the thing. But also I live on Vancouver Island, and uh, I got pretty well. I got. Uh, turkey tail mushrooms, I got chaga and the lion's mane and people picking the stuff for me, eh? So I'm getting it fresh, eh? And uh, I got bags of it and uh, then I've been given bottles, like multiple bottles of moonshine, like a potent, like 180, 200, like almost 200 proof stuff, which I'm going to use to make tinctures out of the mushrooms and stuff as well, eh? Because that's how you get the, get them up to the potency where they're going to really do something. and. Uh, but uh, I've been doing all of this stuff. I went over it with the doctors. I've got two oncologists and my GP that are all sort of involved in this. And then my GP is it's like, people are going, don't tell your doctors about this because they're just gonna fucking, they're not gonna like it. But I figured that's not really wise, eh? Because this stuff, even though it is mostly plants and things like that, it is medicinal shit, you know? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And, uh, so I told them all, and I got the impression from one of the oncologists that he said, yeah, go ahead, you know, because he didn't think, he thought it was insignificant, it would make no effect on anything. But the other one was actually, was interested in what I was doing and was aware of most of the things that I was doing. My GP has been studying this stuff for years yeah. now, and he was all over, he goes, yeah, you picked out a bunch of the best ones here. It turns out, the number one thing is fasting. Oh, really? Yeah, oh yeah, and it, kicks the shit out of cancer. Eh? Uh, 
because you starve it. You starve it to death, and once you're once you're starving, your body kicks into this self-defense mode. So how often do you fast? Uh, well, it's been difficult. I haven't been doing such a good job on the road because we're schedule and stuff like that. But at home, what I did was I I do this uh, what they call restricted eating. You eat between noon and six o'clock and you don't eat between six all the way around to the next day there. So you get 18 hours every day of, uh, of uh, your body. You know, after 12 or 14 hours, you, you've burned off all of the sugar yeah, yeah. and you go into this state where you're running on key, ketones yeah. and cancer can't use the ketones for food. And then after another four, after after 18 hours, you go into this state. Your body starts aggressively recycling damaged material because it's running out of materials to make new cells with. So it, you know, just when the cancer is really starving, all of a sudden it comes in and goes, "Okay, you guys are looking a little defective here. Let's," and it starts aggressively harvest like recycling shit. Which, yeah, it's called, it's called ap apathogy, I think it is. And it translates to eating yourself, essentially, which is essentially what's going on there. But uh, so that, that is really hard on it. And essentially, the oncologist explained, the radiation oncologist said, well, he goes, you should do all of these things because each one of them has its own method of, it, of getting at the cancer. One of them, one of them, like dried ginger powder, is uh, they found dried ginger powder it, it I think it's uh, it's the one that it, it, it inhibits the production of this enzyme that the, that the uh, cancer needs to cloak itself from the immune system and at the same time it also triggers cells to, to uh, defective cells to commit suicide one because they're supposed to die eh? yeah. but that's essentially what causes the cancer is they don't trigger their in their suicide state yeah. and they keep on reproducing. Well, the dry ginger triggers it to do that. So does THC as well, too. Yeah, I hear a lot of the good things about These guys, actually, these guys from, from around here, uh, they're going to be coming tonight. They gave me 459 grams of fucking Rick Simpson oil. And uh, that's good connections. Yeah, yeah. And they're, and they're bringing another load of it for me tonight. I mean, essentially enough that, you know, that I will get all the way through this. I'll have enough yeah. to get all the way through it, and then I'm going to be able to probably give what I have left over to somebody else that needs yeah, yeah. it, you know? And that's awesome. that stuff's got to be applied topically for the best effect, which is awkward because it's up my butt, you know? But uh, but this, I had a tumor. It's only like three or four inches from the exit. And uh, when I started, when I went on tour, I'd try and take a shit, and, of course, the tumor was the only thing that was coming out. I'm fucking sitting there in a goddamn bar bathroom I, I've conditioned myself to, for some very uncomfortable shit lately imagine sitting in the bathroom in a fucking punk rock bar with people out there people are doing rails in the stall next to you and shit and uh, and you're sitting there for an hour you know like just in fucking agony because touch like that's doesn't hurt unless you touch it but it's not good to touch it. It's just fucking horrifying, eh? and it's and it and just the fact that it's there is just enough to make you vomit. You know, you're just like it's bad, eh? and uh, the fucking and you end up shitting the damn thing out. It's fucking hanging out of your ass in the toilet bowl for fuck's sake because you're having these convulsions trying to get shit out of there, and it fucking hurts, eh? and all of these people are all on the walls outside and feeling kind of vulnerable in here with my half of my guts hanging out of my butt, you know, and uh, then you gotta stuff the fucking thing back in there when you're packed to the fucking ears with shit and stuff. It's really a fucking awful experience. That went on for about the first week of the tour, eh? Now, I can shit normal. Thank God. And uh, so, I would say that the tumor is maybe half the size it was, if that even. I can't even barely tell that it's there. I sort of have a mild sensation now, but I used to have to shit around that. It was You're obviously doing something right. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, and that's given just in the last four or five days. It's just gotten to the point where I'm going, I wouldn't even know I had anything if I had it. It's uh, and I'm going, we're winning this one, you know. And if I get, you know, I'm thinking now. I'm thinking I set my goal to survive it to start with. Now I'm thinking. God, if I fucking go real hard on this shit, I might not even have to have surgery for fuck's sake. If I could get out of this without a colostomy bag, a lot of people are going to be happy, believe me.